This is a LibriVox recording in honor of Kristen and Corey's wedding. I'm Paula Berenstein, and this is Elegy 20 to His Mistress Going to Bed by John Donne. Come, madam, come, all rest my powers defy. Until I labor, I in labor lie. The foe oft times, having the foe in sight, is tired with standing, though he never fight. Off with that girdle, like heaven's zone glittering, but a far fairer world encompassing. Unpin that spangled breastplate which you wear, that the eyes of busy fools may be stopped there. Unlace yourself, for that harmonious chime tells me from you that now it is bedtime. Off with that happy busk, which I envy, that still can be and still can stand so nigh. Your gown going off such beauteous state reveals, as when from flowery meads the hill's shadow steals. Off with your wiry coronet, and show the hairy diadems which on you do grow. Off with your hose and shoes, then softly tread in this love's hallowed temple, this soft bed. In such white robes heaven angels used to be revealed to men. Thou, angel, bringest with thee a heaven like Muhammad's paradise. And though ill spirits walk in white, we easily know by this these angels from an evil sprite. Those set our hairs, but these are flesh upright. License my roving hands and let them go before, behind, between, above, below. O oh, my America, my Newfoundland, my kingdom, safest when with one man manned, my mine of precious stones, my empery. How am I blessed in thus discovering thee? To enter in these bonds is to be free. Then, where my hand is set, my soul shall be. Full nakedness, all joys are due to thee. As souls unbodied, bodies unclothed must be to taste whole joys. Gems which you women use are like Atlantis' ball cast in men's views. That when a fool's eye lighteth on a gem, his earthly soul might court that, not them. Like pictures, or like books gay coverings made for laymen, are all women thus arrayed. Themselves are only mystic books, which we, whom their imputed grace will dignify, must see revealed. Then, since that I may know, as liberally as to thy midwife show thyself, cast all, yea, this white linen hence. There is no penance due to innocence. To teach thee I am naked first. Why then? What needest thou have more covering than a man? Wishing you a lifetime of happiness. Recorded at Thousand Oaks, California, April 24, 2006. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine as a wedding present for Kristin and Corey. I'm reading an extract from The Ten Pleasures of Marriage by A. Marsh. And this is from The First Pleasure, The Consent is Given, The Match Concluded, and The Wedding Kept. Well, Mr. Bridegroom, you may freely tickle your fancy to the top and rejoice superabundantly that the match is concluded, and you have now gotten your legs into the stocks, and your arms into such desired for fetters, that nothing but death itself can unloosen them. And you, Mrs. Bride, who look so prettily, 
with such smirking countenance. Be you merry, you are the bride. Yea, the bride that occasions all this tripping and dancing. Now you shall have a husband too, a protector who will hug and embrace you, and sometimes tumble and rumble you, and oft times approach you with a morning salutation that will comfort the very cockles of your heart. He will, if all falls out well, be your comforter, your company keeper, your caretaker, your gentleman usher, nay, all what your heart wish for, or the heavens grant unto you. He'll be your doctor to cure your pale-facedness, your pains in the reins of your back, and at your heart, and all other distempers whatsoever. He will also wipe off all your tears with kisses, and you shall not dream of that thing in the night, but he'll let it be made for you by day. And may not then your bridesmaids ask, Why should you not be merry? End of this extract from The Ten Pleasures of Marriage And I would not recommend the rest of it because it's really quite cynical and not exactly pro-marriage. Read by Gesine in Valletta, April 2006 To Cree and Cory on their wedding. A Valediction Forbidden Morning by John Dunn. As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, while some of their sad friends do say, The breath goes now, and some say no, so let us melt and make no noise. No tear floods nor sigh tempests move To a profanation of our joys To tell the laity of our love. Moving of the earth brings harms and fears Men reckon what it did and meant But trepidation of the spears Though greater far is innocent. Dull subluminary lover's love Whose love is sense cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which elemented it. But we, by a love so much refined, that ourselves know not what it is, inner assured of the mind, care less eyes, lips, and hands to miss. Our two souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go, endure not yet, a breach, but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness beat. If they be two, they are two so, as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth, if the other do. And though it in the center sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it, and grows erect as that comes home. Such will thou be to me, who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Thy firmness makes my circle just, and makes me end where I begun. End. Recorded by Marla Diane. April 23rd, 2006. Iskid West, Prince Edward Island. This is a LibriVox recording in honour of Kristen and Corey's marriage, read by Chris Gorringe. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face, the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Love is Enough by William Morris Read for LibriVox.org In honor of Kristen and Corey's wedding Read by Hugh McGuire Love is enough Though the world be a-waning And the woods have no voice But the voice of complaining Though the sky be too dark For dim eyes to discover The gold cups And daisies fair blooming thereunder Though the hills be held shadows, and the sea a dark wonder, 
and this day draw a veil over all deeds passed over. Yet their hands shall not tremble, their feet shall not falter, the void shall not weary, the fear shall not alter. These lips and these eyes of the loved and the lover. Read April 22nd, 2006 in Montreal, Canada. This is a public domain LibriVox recording, read by Betsy Bush, in honor of Kristen and Corey's marriage, April 22nd, 2006. Love, by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Dreaming of love, the ardent mind of youth, conceives it one with passion's brief delights, with keen desire and rapture. But in truth... These are but milestones to sublime heights, After the highways swept by strong emotions, Where wild winds blow and blazing sun rays beat, After the billows of tempestuous oceans, Fair mountain summits wait the lover's feet. The path is narrow, but the view is wide, And beauteous the outlook towards the west. Happy are they who walk there side by side, Leaving below the valleys of unrest, And on the radiant altitudes above, Know the serene intensity of love. End of poem. Nähe des Geliebten By Johann Wolfgang von Goethe And the translation by Edgar Alfred Bowring Read for LibriVox.org In honor of Kristen and Corey's wedding Read by Rainer Obgenrein Nähe des Geliebten, ich denke dein, wenn mir der Sommerschimmer vom Meere strahlt, ich denke dein, wenn sich des Mondes Flimmer in Quellen malt, ich sehe dich, wenn auf dem fernen Wege der Staub sich hebt, in tiefer Nacht, wenn auf dem schmalen Stege der Wanderer bebt, ich höre dich, wenn dort mit dumpfem Rauschen die Welle steigt, im stillen Hain, da geh ich oft zu lauschen, wenn alles schweigt. Ich bin bei dir, du seist auch noch so ferne, du bist mir nah. Die Sonne sinkt, bald leuchten mir die Sterne, o, oh, wärst du da. Proximity of the Beloved One I think of thee, whenever the sun is beams over ocean flings. I think of thee, whenever the moonlight gleams in silvery springs. I see thee, when upon the distant ridge the dust awakes. At midnight's hour, when on the fragile bridge the wanderer quakes. I hear thee, when yon billows rise on high with murmur deep. To treat the silent grove, oft wander I, when all's asleep. I'm near thee, though, though far away mayst be, thou, too, art near. The sun then sets, the stars soon lighten me, would thou wert here? Read April the twenty third, two thousand six, in Munich, Germany. The Passionate Shepherd to His Love by Christopher Marlowe. Read for LibriVox.org in honor of Kristen and Corey's wedding by Catherine Eastman. Come, live with me and be my love. And we will all the pleasures prove That hills and valleys, dale and field, And all the craggy mountains yield. There will we sit upon the rocks, And see the shepherds feed their flocks By shallow rivers, to whose falls Melodious birds sing madrigals. There I will make thee beds of roses And a thousand fragrant posies, a cap of flowers, and a kirtle, Embroidered all with leaves of myrtle, A gown made of the finest wool Which from our pretty lambs we pull, Fair lined slippers for the cold, With buckles of the purest gold, A belt of straw and ivy buds, With coral clasps and amber studs, and if these pleasures may thee move, Come, live with me, and be my love. 
Thy silver dishes for thy meat, As precious as the gods do eat, Shall on an ivory table be prepared each day For thee and me. The shepherd swains shall dance and sing For thy delight each May morning. If these delights thy mind may move, Then live with me and be my love. End of poem. The Quakerous Bride by Elizabeth Clementine Kinney Read for LibriVox.org In honor of Kristen and Corey's wedding By Laura Fox of ShiningHalf.com No, not in the halls of the noble and proud, Where fashion assembles her glittering crowd, Where all is in beauty and splendor arrayed, Were the nuptials performed of the meek Quaker maid. Nor yet in the temple those rites which she took, By the altar the mitre-crowned bishop and book, Where oft in her jewels stands proudly the bride, Unawed by those vows which through life shall abide. The building was humble, but sacred to one, Who heeds the deep worship that utters no tone, Whose presence is not to the temple confined, but dwells with the contrite and lowly of mind. T'was there all unveiled save by modesty stood, The Quakerous bride in her white satin hood, Her charms unadorned by the garland or gem, Yet fair as the lily just plucked from its stem. A tear glistened bright in her dark shaded eye, And her bosom half uttered a tremulous sigh, as the hand she had pledged was confidingly given, and the low murmured words were recorded in heaven. I've been at the bridal where wealth spread the board, where the sparkling red wine in rich goblets was poured, where the priest in his surplice from ritual read, and the solemn response was impressively said. I've seen the fond sire in his thin locks of gray, Give the pride of his heart to the bridegroom away, While he brushed the big tear from his deep furrowed cheek, And bowed the assent which his lips might not speak. But in all the array of the costlier scene, Naught seemed to my eye so sincere in its mien, No language so fully the heart to resign, As the Quakerous bride's, until death I am thine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dedicated with congratulations to Kristen and Corey, and wishing them many, many happy years together. Sonnet 116 by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Mark Bradford, in commemoration of Kristen and Corey's wedding. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Recorded with sincerest congratulations on April 26, 2006, in Longmont, Colorado. Under the Snow by Robert Collier Read by Kara Schallenberg for LibriVox.org In honor of Kristen and Corey's wedding It was Christmas Eve in the year fourteen, And, as ancient dalesmen used to tell, The wildest winter they ever had seen, With the snow lying deep on moor and fell. When Wagoner John got out his team, 
Smiler and Whitefoot, Duke and Grey, with the light in his eyes of a young man's dream, as he thought of his wedding on New Year's Day. To Ruth, the maid with the bonny brown hair, and eyes of the deepest, sunniest blue, modest and winsome, and wondrous fair, and true to her troth, for her heart was true. "'Thou surely not going!' shouted mine host. "'Thou'll be lost in the drift as sure as thou's born. Thy lass will not want to wed wi' a ghost, and that's what thou'll be on Christmas morn. It's eleven long miles from Skipton Toon to Blueberg Hooses a Washburn Dale. Thou had better turn back and sit thee doon, and comfort thy heart wi' a drop o' good ale. Turn the swallows flying south, turn the vines against the sun, herds from rivers in the drouth, men must dare, or nothing's done. So what cares the lover for storm or drift, or peril of death on the haggard way? He sings to himself like a lark in the lift, and the joy in his heart turns December to May. But the wind from the north brings a deadly chill creeping into his heart, and the drifts are deep, where the thick of the storm strikes Blueberg Hill. He is weary, and falls in a pleasant sleep, and dreams he is walking by Washburn side, walking with Ruth on a summer's day, singing that song to his bonny bride, his own wife now, for ever and I. Now read me this riddle, how Ruth should hear that song of a heart in the clutch of doom, steal on her ear, distinct and clear, as if her lover was in the room. And read me this riddle, how Ruth should know, as she bounds to throw open the heavy door, that her lover was lost in the drifting snow, dying or dead on the great wild moor. Help, help, lost, lost, rings through the night as she rushes away, stumbling, blinded, and tempest-tossed, straight to the drift where her lover lay. And swift they leap after her into the night, into the drifts by Blueberg Hill, Ridsdale and Robinson each with a light, to find her there holding him white and still. He was dead in the drift then, I hear them say, as I listen in wonder, forgetting to play, fifty years sin come Christmas day. Nay, nay, they were wed, the Dalesman cried, by Parson Carmelt on New Year's Day. Bless ye, Ruth were me great-great-grandsire's bride, and Mester Franklin gave her away. But how did she find him under the snow? They cried, with a laughter touched with tears. "'Nay, lads,' he said softly, "'we never can know, no, not if we live a hundred years. "'There's a sight o' things gan to the making o' man. "'Then I rushed to my play, with a whoop and a way. Fifty years sin come Christmas day.'" End of poem. Congratulations, Kristen and Corey. Read on April 26, 2006, in Oceanside, California. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.